It's been clear to see that the high refresh rate 4K monitor segment has been steadily growing over the last 18 months. One could even say it's been gaining momentum. Terrible puns aside, today we are checking out the Philips Momentum 32M1N5800A, offering a 4K 144Hz experience with a 32-inch IPS panel. Hitting the market at just under £760 also means this is cheaper than key rivals from the likes of Asus, Corsair and MSI. Today we're going to put this monitor through its paces and find out whether or not it is worth buying. If we start with a look at the design of the 32M1N5800A, I'd say Philips isn't really doing anything out of the ordinary here. The front of the screen, for instance, uses a bezel-less design with a bottom chin that measures approximately 15mm thick. And we can also see a small Philips logo is placed on the chin in a silver font. As for the back, here we can see a two-tone appearance with a light grey central section and that contrasts with a black plastic area that has a dotted effect for extra visual interest. Philips also makes a feature of the SIAA certified antibacterial treatment given to the monitor surfaces which supposedly inhibits bacterial growth but obviously I've got no way of verifying those claims and whether or not you'll even care. I really don't know, but it's worth mentioning. Moving on then, while the main body of the monitor itself is made from plastic, the stand is made from metal instead, and this gives it a very solid feel. It does look quite thin when viewed from behind, but the base of the stand does have a pretty aggressive angular appearance, and it almost reminds me of the Spider-Man logo, but I don't know whether or not that's just me. The included stand also offers a full range of ergonomic adjustments, we get height adjust up to 130 millimeters. There's also 45 degrees of swivel, both left and right. There's tilt from five degrees downwards to 20 degrees upwards. And finally, there is also full 90 degree pivot functionality. So you can use the screen vertically. Those with third party monitor arms or wall mounts will also be glad to know that VESA 100 by 100 brackets are supported. As for the video inputs, these are all found on the back of the display and it's really good to see two DisplayPort 1.4 and then two HDMI 2.1, both of which offer the full 48 gigabit per second bandwidth. This of course means that all four video inputs can give you the 4K 144Hz experience on PC, while the two HDMI 2.1 ports will of course support 4K 120 for the latest PS5 or Xbox Series consoles. We also get a 3.5mm audio jack and then a total of four 5 gigabit per second USB Type A ports with the two yellow ones supporting BC 1.2 fast charging. Lastly, a small joystick is positioned on the back of the monitor and this is of course used to control the OSD and it's actually the only button on the entire monitor. The OSD itself then is split into 11 main tabs, though I do think some of these feel a bit unnecessary. I'm not sure why a whole tab is needed just for the low blue mode for instance, while it would also make sense to me to combine the HDMI refresh rate setting in the input menu instead. It's definitely not a big deal and with the joystick you can easily move around through all the different menus, but it does just feel like there's quite a number of different tabs to flick through. I wouldn't say it's an especially good looking UI either, but I can't complain too much as pretty much all of the key functionality is there. The only thing I noticed to be missing was really any form of shadow boost, but how much you really care about that is going to depend. If you connect your monitor to your PC via a USB cable as well, there is also the option to download the Philips Smart Control Utility and tweak the display settings through the software. Smart Control, however, looks like it has come straight out of the Windows XP era, but I suppose it is better than nothing and you don't have to use it after all as it is an optional extra.
Enough about the design though, let's move on to talk about panel performance. Starting off with our Spider-X colorimeter testing. Straight away, we can see decent gamut coverage for the 32M1M 5800A. It's not going to be as wide as something like the Corsair 32UHD144, as that does make use of a quantum dot layer, but with 100% sRGB, 85% Adobe RGB, and then 92% DCI-P3 coverage, it's not a bad start. It's also great to see a peak brightness reading of over 500 nits, which I have to say is pretty impressive for a 32 inch SDR display. A minimum brightness of 77 nits is also okay. We have seen better, but it's passable. It is good to see solid contrast though from this IPS panel, as we saw a peak contrast ratio of 1070 to one. My only real complaint here though is gonna be the white point, which is slightly cool, varying between 7100K and 7400K. We can also see that out of the box color accuracy is impressive with an average delta E of just 0.73. There is that one blue shade, which is the biggest problem area with a delta E of 3.05 for that color patch. But otherwise the overall accuracy is very solid. After calibration, we see an even better average delta E as well, of just 0.42, which I have to say is incredibly good. Though annoyingly, we still weren't able to improve the accuracy of that pesky blue channel reading. Next up then is going to be our response time testing, where we're using the open source response time tool as developed by Tech Team GB. The Philips 32M1N5800A has three different overdrive modes, as well as overdrive off, I'm gonna start off at 144 Hz. Starting then at 144 Hz performance with overdrive turned off, this gives us a good idea of the panel's native performance. And I have to say, it is not bad at all. With an average gray to gray response time of 7.73 milliseconds, this bodes well for our testing when we start to introduce the different overdrive modes. Enabling the fast overdrive mode though, isn't particularly effective at 144 Hz, as it only slightly improves on average response times, which now hit 7.08 milliseconds. So it's really not much faster than having no overdrive. The faster overdrive mode, however, is the best of the lot. This just improves response time significantly with a new average of 4.93 milliseconds, which is not bad at all. Fall times though do seem to be the biggest problem area for the 32M1N5800A, and you can see that in the bottom left corner of the heat map, particularly that transition from a full white back to full black. But overall response times are still much improved in this mode. The faster overdrive mode though does start to exhibit a touch of overshoot, but honestly, it's barely worth mentioning. The biggest error is just seven RGB value, so it's just not noticeable at all in real world usage. The final overdrive mode then is called fastest and unfortunately this one is only included so Philips can claim a one millisecond response time on the box as the overshoot is just ludicrously high. Don't even bother trying this mode out as it's simply unusable. I do think that is a bit of a shame however as the faster mode has very little overshoot while the fastest mode has just way too much overshoot so Ideally, I think there could be a middle ground between those two settings, which would push response times that bit faster while still having an acceptable amount of overshoot. And this is really one of the key reasons why I would love to see more monitor manufacturers implementing user configurable overdrive. It's also worth making clear that there's no single overdrive mode for the 32M1N5800A. We did also test the faster mode at 120 Hertz and it is still very usable there, admittedly with a touch more overshoot, but once we drop down to 90 Hertz using the faster mode, the overshoot becomes a lot more noticeable, at which point it's actually worth switching over to the fast mode as that will deliver better performance. Yes, its response times aren't super fast with an average of 6.94 milliseconds, but that is still well within the 11 millisecond refresh window, plus there's no overshoot either. The same does go for 60 Hertz as well, where once more the faster mode just has way too much overshoot, so the fast mode is what we're going to recommend. For adaptive sync gamers then, it is a shame there's no single overdrive mode, 
But as a quick summary of my recommendations, if you are pushing over 90 FPS, I would recommend the faster overdrive mode, but below that, stick with the fast overdrive mode. If we take a quick look at overall relative performance then, this is using the best overdrive mode at the maximum refresh rate. And here we can see the Philips 32M1N 5800A is actually towards the top of our chart. Importantly, it is decently faster than some of its key rivals, including the Corsair 32 UHD144, the Asus PG32UQ, and the MSI MPG321URQD. As for what this means for real world gaming, I found the performance to be very fluid, especially when driving higher frame rates, where I would stick with the faster overdrive mode. Enabling DLSS in Spider-Man Remastered, for instance, actually got me over 100 FPS with an RTX 3090, so web slinging around New York looked absolutely fantastic. I'm also partial to some Call of Duty, and again, I really can't fault the motion performance there. Obviously, if you are more a competitive gamer, there are going to be 1440p and 1080 displays with 240 or even 360 hertz refresh rates, which will give you that increased motion clarity. But at 4K, you also can't overlook the sheer amount of detail you get. For me, 4K at 32 inches is a noticeable upgrade over a 27 inch 1440p panel due to the extra sharpness, though obviously you will need a beefy GPU to drive it. It's also good to see that latency is not a problem for the 32M1N 5800A. If you do have adaptive sync disabled within the OSD, there is an option to turn off low input lag, but I don't recommend it as that increased latency to 20.4 milliseconds. With that mode enabled though, we can see latency that is right in line with other 4K 144Hz monitors. Speaking of adaptive sync as well, the good news is this screen has been officially certified as NVIDIA G-Sync compatible and it's also AMD FreeSync Premium certified. The only real downside there is that the adaptive sync range only kicks in above 60Hz, so that brings us back to the point that you will either need a very beefy GPU to drive this screen or you'd have to be happy to lower the image quality settings. Viewing angles are also decent, but perhaps not as good as some other IPS displays that I've used recently. I did notice the image becoming a little bit duller and with crushed blacks as I moved around the outside of this screen. You'd still easily be able to get two people around this display and have a good experience, but this is just something to be aware of. There's also just a small amount of backlight bleed in each of the top corners, but really nothing major at all, and it certainly didn't bother me while gaming. Much more disappointing though is going to be the HDR, or lack thereof. So technically this screen is VESA Display HDR 400 certified, but if you've seen any of my monitor reviews, you'll know I just don't count this as real HDR. It doesn't even require any form of local dimming, not even edge lit dimming, so for me, this really doesn't give a proper HDR experience. The thing to keep in mind about this, however, is that honestly, most 32 inch 4K displays around this price point only offer display HDR 600 certification anyway, which really isn't much better in my opinion. So you're not losing out on much in the HDR department if you stick with this screen instead of a competitor. For a proper HDR experience, you'd really want something with full array local dimming, but in the 32 inch 4K class, those are significantly more expensive. Overall then, with the high refresh rate 4K monitor market gathering steam over the last year or two, it is safe to say the Philips Momentum 32M1N 5800A is another capable contender joining the mix. The key takeaway for me really is just the speed of this panel, as its sub 5 millisecond average response time is actually faster than the likes of the Corsair 32 UHD144, the Asus PG32UQ, and the MSI MPG321URQD. The speed on offer is also backed up by strong image quality, with impressive out-of-the-box colour accuracy and a decent contrast ratio for an IPS panel. Factor in the two HDMI 2.1 ports to go along with the two DisplayPort 1.4 connectors, and there really is a lot to like here. My main criticism for this display is the basically non-existent HDR, but 
as we already touched on, the same really does go for most other monitors in this class. There are a few other nice to have features that I would have liked to see included, such as USB Type-C and user configurable overdrive, but I suppose I can live without those. Ultimately, for £760, I actually think that the value proposition here is very strong. It's obviously not going to appeal to those looking for a proper immersive HDR experience, but if you just want a fast 4K 144Hz monitor, that's also 50 to 100 pounds cheaper than some of the more established brands, then the Philips Momentum 32 M1N 5800A is well worth a look. Anyway guys, that is going to do it for this review, so if you liked it, please do toss me a thumbs up, and as always, let me know your thoughts on this screen in the comments below. You can also subscribe if you haven't already and ding that notification bell, and why not come chat with us in our Discord server, which is linked in the description. While there, you can also find a link to our merch store, and if you're feeling particularly generous, you could even consider backing us on Patreon. That's it for this one though, guys. I'm Dominic Fulkit Guru, and I'll see you in the next video.